Barakatu. May the peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah be upon you. Uh, this video is about proof Islam is true. Being Muslim is not about blind faith, but reasoning too. The very basics are best covered by Rene Descartes' argument, summarized as I think, therefore I am. How do I know I exist? Because I'm able to think, therefore I must exist. He wrote an excellent book called The Meditations on First Philosophy, in which he pursues truth in a very interesting manner. Everything that can be a lie, even 1%, is discarded. So all the physical senses. The fundamental truth that remains, I think, therefore I am. The second truth is I didn't create myself, so I must have a creator. Beyond that, the book, like, isn't that worth reading? I've given you the real meat and potatoes, but if you want to see how he works through it, it's worth checking out. Now, this is an incredibly profound truth. Because even if we live in a computer simulation or the matrix, it still has to be true. You're thinking, therefore you must exist. Even if reality all around you is fake, you know, even if we're in a computer simulation, the fact that you can think means you exist. It's such a profound truth. That's the fundamental truth that even if you were in a dungeon or in a basement and never knew what the sky was or the sun, you would still be able to discover this using nothing but logic. And therefore, if you exist, you must have a creator. Something has to have created you, right? You didn't create yourself. And to avoid an infinite regression, you must have an uncreated creator or an uncaused first cause. Basically, if you go back and say, well, you know, Something created me, but then what created that? What created that? What created that? At the very beginning, it has to go back to a fundamental uncreated creator that created everything. And that uncreated creator must be eternal due to being outside space and time, must not have an observable body since a body is limited, and also because a body is outside of our space and time, right? Must be all-powerful because it created the universe, and must be singular. So what did we just do now? We just logically deduced Allah using only logic got Surah Al-Ikhlas, uh, the one twelfth verse of the Quran. Okay? Kul huwa Allahu ahad. Allah is one. Allahu samad. Allah is eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is he begotten. وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ There is nothing in creation comparable to him. Please note, Allah is not him. It's royal plural in Arabic. Allah has no gender. This is a common misconception. The Muslim God is very different than the Christian God. It's not a father. It's uh, an all-powerful entity that has no human attributes, no face, no nothing. Um, and is not limited by space and time. So, what is the most compelling argument for God? I think the Christian argument is weak, since they say 1 equals 3. The Muslim argument is better, since 1 equals 1. No disrespect to our Christian friends, but stating facts, inshallah you join us on the true path of Prophet Jesus salam. So why else Islam? For me, it was the scientific miracles. And there are plenty, as well as the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that came true with zero errors. It's statistically impossible, so close to a 0% chance for him to do all this correctly. And I'm going to work through some predictions. Now, non-Muslims will tell you that's not true. Lots of people can make predictions like that. There's been over 109 billion people in human history. If the chances of Prophet Muhammad's pro predictions being right is 0.01%, there, there should be about 10.9 million people who had similar predictions with the same accuracy. So we Muslims aren't greedy. We ask them to produce one other person if they're sincere. I've had this offer out for a long time. They can't. So here's some prophecies that came true. There are a lot more, but this post would be 
uh, too long if I were to go through all of them. This is already. So when you see the barefoot, naked, destitute shepherds competing and making tall buildings. So this is in Sinan and Nisei, uh, 4990. You can find it on this website, which is a great website to find hadith. So it's sunnah.com. It's also found in Sahih Muslim 8E, Ibn Majah 63. I might be pronouncing Ibn Majah wrong because I have it in front of me in English. I'm not sure what Arabic letters those translate to. So this is very significant because Arabs were building, living, and the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu time were living in tents as the Romans, Persians, and Egyptians were building marvels. So it seems almost nonsensical as a prediction for him to make back then. Next one. So that Arabia would return to being lush with meadows and rivers. This is Sahih Muslim 157C, okay? So if we Google Saudi Arabia farming, this is what we get. And this is, you know, real pictures now. So this would have been unimaginable to a Bedouin in the desert in the 7th century. But subhanAllah, Prophet Muhammad was right. Next, now this is also an article, and you can Google it and find it for yourself, of natural meadows in Saudi Arabia. If you just Google meadows Saudi Arabia... And so these are actual pictures of a natural occurring meadow, right? A meadow lying in the middle of Saudi Arabia's golden sounds becomes more beautiful in the winter with rings that fill it up with cloaks. And this one's called Raudat al-Khaf's meadow. It goes from the west and al-Urma mountains in the east. So as you can see, this would have been completely unfathomable about back then. Now here's the other significant part so it's not just that he predicted that Saudi Arabia would be meadows. He said it would return meadows. And so we recently discovered that, about, that Saudi Arabia was lush about 5,000 years ago. Okay? And this is a BBC article on it, but you can Google to confirm. And so now here's another prediction. So this is Quran 1092. And what it's basically saying is today we will preserve your corpse. This is talking about Ramses II, the pharaoh that was chasing Moses. So that you will maybe become an example for those who come after you. And surely most people are heedless of our examples. So this is the corpse of Ramses II. As you can see, it's perfectly preserved. To my knowledge, it's the only uh, Egyptian pharaoh that knows remained intact. You still have his hair. And this is Maurice Bukhair. So he was the chief surgeon in charge of France in doing the dissection and examination, basically the autopsy of, of Ramses. And he found it as this huge miracle that his body was so perfectly preserved that he actually wrote, was doing a publishing tour. And somebody came up to him and told him, actually, this was written in a book 1300 years ago. And when they showed him it in the Quran, he decided he didn't believe it. And so he went and learned Arabic. And then he converted to Islam and became a figure. And he went through a lot of character assassination. They still try to attack him and discredit him till today. But he was literally the most foremost surgeon in the world, or at least in France. And he's the biggest expert on Ramses because he's the one who operated on him. And you'll find that as a common thread. Anytime people try to speak out about the truth of the Qur'an, they get attacked like crazy. So now this one is about, the, this is the Surah 30, and the verses are between 2 to 6. It's called Surah al rum which is about the Romans. And it talks about the Romans being defeated, which is what had just happened, and it was a very significant one, in a nearby land. And it also can mean like the lowest physical geographic location, which also happened. And fi buda sanina, Allah. So basically, what's buda? Buda means three to nine years. It's an Arabic word. And so the Romans actually, this this is a prediction telling you the Romans were going to win as a sign from God. When it happened, people really doubted Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And it was mentioned as a prophet. Now, I know some English speakers say, well, Buda is uh, three to nine. That's really vague. It's not. In Arabic, Buda is the combination of the words few and several. 
And that's why. It's just instead of having a few and several word, they, they use bada. And so this one was so far-fetched at the time, and you can look up a lot of historians' accounts of why the, their defeat by the Persians was so devastating. Um, and so in the Quran, Allah kind of reminds people, is like, he'll give the victory. This is a promise. Allah never fails in his promise. But most people do not know, because that's how far-fetched it was. And this is one of the only cases in the Quran when Allah mentions something, and then he repeats it multiple times. Alright. Next, we have women will be dressed but appear to be naked, inviting to evil, and they themselves will be inclined to it. So as um, so, this is in Riyadh Salihin, 1633. Anyone who can walk down the streets in just about any Western country will tell you this is uh, quite accurate. I find the most interesting thing is a lot of the times, you know, like with leggings, you see everything. And they didn't have fabrics like that that would show you everything despite wearing clothes. Next is Surat Abu, uh, Abu Lahab, Al Surat Al Masad, sorry. So it tells the story of Abu Lahab and his wife are going to go to hell. So this is uh, the uncle of the Prophet who used to follow him around harassing him, and they were early enemies of Islam. So this, what makes this verse significant is it came out about a decade before they died. And so all they had to do to prove Islam wrong was convert. But Allah knew that they never would. And so that's why he gave this A. So by comparison, Amr bin Khattab anhu, was a fierce enemy of Islam who became the second caliph after Prophet Muhammad wasallam, and arguably its greatest leader. He conquered the most territories, he conquered Persia among others. His, his conversion happened after Prophet Muhammad وسلم, prayed one of the two Amars would convert. And Amr bin Khattab عنه, he converted en route to kill the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. And so if anybody was going to be written about, if you were going to guess who's worse, you'd probably think it would have been Amr bin Khattab Now these ones are significant. So this is Sahih al-Bukhari 6285 and 6286. So this is the prediction Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam predicting his death because the angel Gabriel used to come with him every year and go over the Quran. But this year he went over it twice. And so Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam told his daughter Fatima radhiallahu anha that he thinks his death is coming soon. Now in another hadith and this one here is also Sahih al-Bukhari and it's 3625 and 3626 is that his daughter Fatima radallahu anha would be the first to join him. So in Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu fatal illness, he called his daughter, told her a secret because of which she started weeping. Then he called her again and told her another secret and she started laughing. And one eye, which is Aisha radallahu the Prophet's wife, asked her about that. She replied, the Prophet sallallahu told me that he would die in his fatal illness, and so I wept. But then he secretly told me that from amongst his family, I would be the first to join him, so I laughed. That's how much Fatima radallahu used to love her father. And then the next one is the order in which his wives would die. So... This is in Mishkat al-Masabih, al-Masabih, sorry, when I'm doing videos I get nervous and I start mispronouncing things. And this is 1875, and it's also in Sinan and nisai 2541, okay? So before the Prophet Muhammad died, وسلم, he told his wives, um, they, they asked him which would be the first to die, and he told them the one with the longest arm. And so the, his wives used to compare the length of their arms. They misunderstood that in Arabic, the one with the longest arm means the most charitable. And his wife Zainab was the most charitable, charitable, sorry, passed away uh, after him. She was the first to fall. All right. <clears throat> so the next slide is Sayyidina Muhammad predicted the assassination of two of the three caliphs following his death. So this is Umar bin Khattab and Uthman 
Um, and this is in Sahih al-Bukhari 3675. So the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, once climbed the mountain of Uhud with Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman radiallahu anhu. The mountain shook with them and the Prophet وسلم, said to the mountain, Be firm, O Uhud, for on you there are no more than a prophet, a Siddiq, and two martyrs. So a Siddiq, uh, for those unaware, is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, his, his nickname was a Siddiq. He's Abu Bakr a Siddiq. And that's because he was known as the honest one, because he would never lie. The Prophet also predicted the conquests of Egypt, Persia, Persia Sham, which is uh, like Lebanon, Palestine, Syria, uh, Yemen, and Istanbul slash Constantinople, which obviously came true. Those are scattered, so it's harder to cite exactly where, but you can find it. Next, the unavoidability of interest in the future. So this is Sinan and Nisa'i again. And for the time, this was a very bold prediction to make, but I mean, it's very accurate too today. There will come a time when there will be no one left who does not consume riba, which is interest, and whoever does not consume it will nevertheless be affected by its residue. So what is affected by its residue? Interest rates actually cause inflation. And so this one has proven completely true. And in the Prophet's time, interest was strictly forbidden. So it was a pretty bold prediction back then. Next, uh, this is Sinan Abi Dawood 4297. So this is the collapse of the Ottoman Empire. Okay. And this was all, again, known by our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So basically, the prediction is of the weakness of Muslims as other nations invite each other to devour them, despite Muslims being plentiful in number. And to show you how accurate this is, for the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, it was eight European countries that conspired to invade. It was Russia, the UK, France, Italy, Greece, Bulgaria, Serbia, and Montenegro. If that doesn't sound like a feast, I don't know what it was. So they invited each other to feast. Also, there was internal traders like Ataturk, who joined Batan al Hariya in 1905. The Young Turk Revolution, which uh, joined, uh, which happened in 1908 that overthrew the Sultan. The Three Bashas, or Pashas, depending on your language, in 1913, and Armenians. So it was weak despite its vast numbers. Contrary to popular belief, the Arabs and the Kurds actually did not betray the Ottoman Sultan. They betrayed the traitors because the Arabs had their revolution in 1916 and the Kurds in 1914 to 17 and then 1920 on. So, um, and that was because the secularists started really discriminating against uh, the minorities of the empire because they were no longer united under Islam because in Islam, you know, racism is forbidden. Now, in Sahih al-Bukhari 3590, this is the prediction of the invasion of the Mongols. The hour will not be established till you fight with Khuzan and the Karman from among the non-Arabs. They will be of red faces, flat noses, small eyes, and their faces will look flat, look like flat shields, and their shoes will be of hair. And so... Pretty accurate prediction, I would say, for someone who had never seen a Mongolian before. Because remember, one, Prophet Muhammad, the furthest east he had gone was to, uh, to Palestine or Syria, depending on, um, like, there's a possibility that's the furthest that east that he's gone. And the Mongols were still stuck behind the Great Wall of China back then. Next... We have uh, Miracles of Embryology in the Quran. This is a long one with a lot of sections, so I'm not citing exactly where it is here, um, but you can look it up. So Dr. Keith Moore was the head of embryology at the University of Toronto. Now, he never converted to Islam due to his Christian upbringing. 
He's, he, in one of his videos, he stated he would have if his father wasn't a minister. But he stated that Prophet Muhammad وسلم, had to be a messenger of God for the details he knew of embryology. He mentioned several of his colleagues converted to Islam over their discovery. So what happened with Keith Moore is uh, Saudis approached him and they told him, hey, look, we have some details about embryology in our holy book. Can you come with us and, and help us? understand if this is accurate or if there's anything here and so he went to Saudi Arabia he studied it for a while they brought it they provided him with a lot of translators and he found that the Quran actually predicted a lot about embryology so now this is Quran 2130 do the disbelievers not realize that the heavens and earth were once one mass then we split them apart and we created from water every living thing Will they not then believe? So I want you to think about that. And I know some people will try to claim that it's the translations. In the interest of the length of the video, it's not. If you want me to do a deep dive, I'll be glad to. But to give you an idea, Ratkan means a joined entity and a Ratuk is a disease where you, you don't have a hole in your ear because it's so clamped together and the word to split them apart is and is it's tore them asunder it involves like a violent tear it's not like a gentle split apart and then is uh, we made from water every living thing will they then not believe like imagine this is sitting in a book from a 7th century Bedouin and then here's the next, another verse, Quran 5147. We built the universe with great might and we are certainly expanding it. So this is Hubble's law. Actually, I wasn't aware of this one until somebody was arguing that uh, the sky verse was impossible to be about the Big Bang. And he said, if you don't mention, like, if it was, there would be Hubble's law. And I was, like, writing up a response saying it's impossible for Hubble's law to be inside the Quran because you need to, to explain electricity and then satellite and all this stuff. And then I found Hubble's law in the Quran, subhanAllah. Like, subhanAllah. So Hubble's law was discovered in the late 1900s, like in the early to mid-1900s. And that's that the universe is always expanding. And then... After all this evidence, some people still refuse to believe, and that's also written in the Quran. Summon bukmun amion fahum la yarjaun. They are willing, willfully deaf, dumb, and blind, so they will never return to the right path. When you have this much evidence and you still refuse to believe, what other explanation do we have? Uh, I hope you found this video beneficial. Please share it with people. Um, Pardon the trip ups and pronunciation in English and in Arabic. <laughs> I'm not good at video editing, so I literally just record all this in one go. I get nervous, uh, I get stressed. I'm looking at a TV monitor above. It's it's not easy for me. And yeah, I hope you found this beneficial. Um, so, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.